Hi, readers. Welcome to Books Connect Us from Penguin Random House. This is a podcast about staying connected with each other and the stories and authors who inspire us. Born in Peru and raised in Chile, Isabel Allende is the author of a number of best-selling and critically acclaimed books, including The House of the Spirits, Of Love and Shadows, Eva Luna, and In the Midst of Winter. Her books have been translated into more than 42 languages and have sold more than 74 million copies worldwide. Her latest is A Long Petal of the Sea, an epic novel spanning decades and crossing continents, follows two young people as they flee the aftermath of the Spanish Civil War in search of a place to call home. Now let's join literary agent Johanna Castillo and Random House Editor-in-Chief Jennifer Hershey in conversation with the author Isabel Allende. So, hi, this is Jennifer Hershey. I am the Valentine Editor-in-Chief and the very, very lucky editor for Isabel Allende, our author who's with us today for this conversation. She's the author of her, her most recent novel is um, A Long Petal of the Sea, which we're going to talk about today, among many other things. Um, and I'm also with Johanna Castillo, who's Isabel's agent, um, and who's going to be uh, helping me have this wonderful conversation with Isabel. So let's get started. Welcome, Isabel. So excited to be talking to you. Thank you so much for having me. Nice to uh, see your face also. <laughs> you too, you too. <laughs> Although in the podca- podcast, we don't see your face. I no. love looking at you. <laughs> How have you been doing? There's so much going on in the world. How have you been surviving the pandemic and the fires in California? How how have you been? Well, the fires have been really awful. But the pandemic, I'm getting used to it, you know. Being a writer, I'm used to be alone in silence writing. So I, I don't miss traveling. I don't miss social life. And I do get out to walk the dogs. So I'm still in nature. Uh, And I'm recently married, so uh, it's been quite a test for this prolonged honeymoon (laughs) locked with my husband. Um, But the the fires have been really awful in California, and uh, we are still just breathing smoke. I'm so sorry. It's so awful to hear about that. I will say that editors are secretly happy that the pandemic is keeping all the uh, writers at their desk and at their computers finishing their books. So that's my, yeah. my little secret. I can imagine that, yes. <laughs> and Isabel, and has the pandemic affected in any way your creativity, your, uh, how you go about writing every day? No, not at all. On the contrary, I would say that it has helped because I don't have any distractions. I do get a lot of emails, of course, and I do interviews and and Zoom. But um, the fact that I'm not traveling, that I am locked at home, forces me to be at my keyboard most of the day. And I just love the process. I have time to research, I have time to write, to go back and look at things calmly. I'm taking it slowly. I, I want to enjoy this, process I'm writing another novel as much as possible because I I want to to sort of stretch it for as long as the pandemic lasts. I'm trying so hard not to uh, ask you questions about what you're writing right this minute. No, don't because I won't answer. I know, I know it's a secret even from us. So um, maybe we should talk about the book we can talk about, which is A Long Petal of the Sea. Um, And I'm so curious to to hear you talk about um, how that book got started and where that started in your imagination. Actually, it didn't start in my imagination. The the story was there for 40 years waiting for me to tell it. Um, 40 years ago, when I was living in exile in Venezuela, I met a man called Victor Pei, who was also a Chilean exile. Well, he actually was a Spaniard but he had lived in Chile 30 years. And we met there and he told me the story of his life. He escaped from the, at the end of the civil war in Spain in 1939, he escaped from Barcelona to the border with France with half a million people that were refugees escaping from fascism and ended up in a concentration camp 
in, in France, an improvised place in a beach where people were just held there with no water, no food, nothing. And in the meantime, the poet Pablo Neruda in Chile convinced the government to receive some refugees. And the, the government approved, but didn't give him any money. So he went to Paris, raised money, bought a cargo ship called the Winnipeg, and um, selected 2,200 people to come to Chile as, uh, as refugees. And uh, they came, it, it was a long trip, right at the beginning, at, at the end of the civil war in Spain and the beginning of the, of the Second World War, which was brewing there, ready to start. And um, they came to Chile, they were received with open arms, included in the society immediately. Well, they have contributed to Chile immensely, those passengers and their descendants, more than 10,000 people now. And um, they landed in Chile, they are, the, the ship arrived in the port of Valparaíso the same day that the Second World War started in Europe, September 3rd, 1939. And these people lived in Chile, had a life, and then we had the military coup in 1973. And many of them had to go into a second exile for similar in similar circumstances. And so that was the case of Victor Pei, whom I met in Venezuela. So he told me all this story. And he was waiting for Franco to die to go back to Spain, finally to his country. Franco died in 1975. He returned a year later to Spain and found another country. He found he had, he had no connection, no roots there anymore. Everything had changed so much. So eventually, when we had democracy again in Chile in 1990, he returned to live in Chile and died there. Um, I, when I wrote the book, I was in touch with him constantly. I mean, we would email and phone calls and I went to Chile to talk with him many times for the details of the book. And I didn't, I never told him that I was writing his story and that he, that the book would be dedicated to him because I wanted it to be a surprise. And he died six days before I could send him the manuscript dedicated to him. He was 103 years old, lucid and strong, still working, just an incredible man. That's so heartbreaking that he didn't get a chance to, to yeah. know about the book, but maybe- But his, do his daughters did, his daughters did. Oh, that is great, that is great. Uh, Isabel, I'm, I'm talking a little bit more about the, the main characters in the book, uh, Victor and Roser. Uh, their love story, uh, mainly. Um, is this, uh, the, the love between the, them reflects the love that you have come to understand in life? You know, in all my books, love plays an important role because it has determined my life in many ways. I wouldn't be in the United States if I hadn't fallen in love or in lust with Willie Gordon. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> Um, but the, the story of Roser and, and Victor in the book is unusual. They marry, it's a marriage of convenience. They have to get on the ship as a family. So they get married. And they come to Chile as a family with the idea that they would divorce. And they find themselves in a country where there is no divorce. There, there, there was no divorce until 2014, I think. So, <laughs> so they, they couldn't. They couldn't divorce and they stayed together. They could have separated, but they stayed together and they developed this incredible relationship based on friendship and trust. And they supported each other during all these years. And then when they were older in their 60s, the military coup happened and they confront the possibility of death, that they will be separated by death. And they fall madly in love. And so the last few years of their life, they are an elderly couple, absolutely in love, enjoying every minute of the life they have together. Uh, usually the usual story is that people 
fall passionately in love, then they develop a friendship, and then they end up married for convenience because it's, why would you divorce at 70? Only I can do that, but most people just stay. <laughs> stay in a bad relationship, you know? <laughs> so I have known love in all its forms. I think I fell in love the first time when I was around seven years old. And I have been always in love with different men, of course, but, <laughs> but, but always. So now that I'm old, I know that it is possible to be in love like a teenager. The only difference now and that happens in the book, is that sense of urgency, that you don't have any time to waste, that every day is precious, that there's no time for jealousy, for little fights, for, for the little stupid games that couples play, for, for intolerance and impatience. You don't have time for that. That's so beautiful. You're making me want to read the book all over again. And I've read it a few <laughs> times already as your editor. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about your own uh, experience as a refugee and how that informed the book. Um, you were forced into exile as well. Yes, but I was a very privileged refugee. I never had to live in a tent in the desert. I never had to go in an inflatable boat across the Mediterranean and end up having my children drown. Um, I just went to Venezuela, which at the time in the 70s was one of the few democracies in Latin America. It was a very wealthy country because of the oil boom. It was open, generous. It received immigrants from all over the world. There was work and opportunities for everybody. Uh, so I was in that sense very privileged. But <clears throat> there is a difference, be and I have been both so I can say, uh, it's a diff there's a difference between being a refugee and being an, an immigrant. A refugee is someone who is practically expelled from their own land. Sometimes they're running away for their lives and they don't have many choices. They just go anywhere, it, they just get out. That's what matters. An immigrant usually chooses where to go. They are young. They are looking at the future. They want to establish themselves in, in a new country, form a family, um, have a life. They are not looking at the past. They look at the future. Refugees are always wanting to go back. And few, few do go back. The average time that a refugee spends away from home is between 17 and 25 years. By the time they return, if they return, their children and grandchildren will not go back with them. They don't know anything about the old country. So they don't have a country anymore. And, and they, th their hearts are always in the past. Um, the other thing about being a refugee that I experienced very strongly, not only that you live in, in, a, in a mood of nostalgia and longing, and always looking at the past and inventing a country that is way better than the country that you really left. But, but you don't know the rules in the new place, the codes, the clues. Um, everything is strange. You don't have connections. In Latin America, everything is about family, clan, tribe, connections. If you want to find a job, your curriculum is not what will get you the job. It's because you have a friend who is a cousin of your cousin and, and so forth. Uh, so you, for, for a Latin American to go to another country in Latin America, even if you know the language, you are like in, in another planet. You don't have the, the, the crutches, the social crutches that have sustained you all your life. And you've lost the extended family which is terrible because we live in an extended family. I have never been able to recover that family. I have recreated other extended families in every place where I have been. And in many ways it works, but it takes a very long time to do that. Uh, Isabel, and um, now that you're talking about uh, what we have left behind, right? Um, uh, Pablo Neruda is an important character in the book and also because of the historical uh, context of uh, what he had to do with the, with the Winnipeg. But we also know that you uh, 
personally met him. Uh, could you talk a, bit, a little bit about that? Well, uh, I, I hadn't seen him, let's say, from, from a certain distance many times. But um, in August of 1973, like a month and a half before the military coup uh, in Chile, he invited me to his house in Isla Negra. In August, Chile is in winter because of the Southern Hemisphere. So I drove in the, in the wind and the, and the rain to his house for two hours and got there. And um, he was very kind. He, he, he had been ill, but that was a good day. We had lunch, we had a bottle of white wine. And then I said, Don Paulo, I really have to interview you and go back home because it's getting dark. And he said, I would never be interviewed by you. I was a journalist. And he said, you are the worst journalist in this country. You, you, you lie all the time. I mean, I would, I would really do very good journalism today, you know. He, he said, you lie all the time. You cannot be objective. You invent stories when you don't have them. Why don't you switch to literature where all these defects are virtues? I felt so offended. And I went back without the interview because he would not accept to be interviewed by me. A month and a half later, we had the military coup, and 11 days after the coup, he died. But we, one of his many legacies is that we have a novelist in you, and that's... Uh, oh, it has nothing to do with Neruda, because I totally <laughs> forgot the story, and I never thought I would be a writer until many years later, when I was living in exile in Venezuela, and out of nostalgia, I wrote The House of the Spirits. I didn't even remember Neruda at the time. Tell the story of how the House of the Spirit began. Was it as a letter to someone? Well, my grandfather, I was raised in my grandfather's house as a, as a little girl. And then when I was 16, I went back to live with him because my parents were living in Turkey. So I was really, really close to that old man. And uh, he was the most important male influence in my life, more even than my stepfather, who was my best friend and with whom I lived so many, many years. But my grandfather sort of planted his voice inside my head. His voice is my consciousness. And um, he was dying in Chile. I was in Venezuela. I couldn't go back to bid him farewell. And I started a letter, a sort of spiritual letter to tell him that he could go in peace. I, I remembered everything he had told me, all the anecdotes, all the family stories I remembered. And so I started with the first story, which was the story of my great aunt Rosa, uh, my grandmother's oldest sister, who was my, my grandfather's fiancée. And she died before the wedding in mysterious circumstances. She was called Rosa. And they, everybody remembered her as Rosa the Beautiful. There was a photograph of her on the piano. And she was just this little, I don't know, bland, <laughs> bland lady in a sepia color. Nothing particularly beautiful in my opinion. But my grandfather would always say she was beautiful as a mermaid. And I had the idea that mermaids had green hair. So that's why in the House of the Spirits, Rosa has green hair. Mm -hmm. And so I started writing the story of Rosa. And then in, in a matter of, I would say, hours, after a few paragraphs, I realized that I was making most of it up. That it was, of course, memory, what he had told me. But I was adding to his memory my own creation and my own memory. And I kept writing. I wrote about the dog that I remember, the, the Grand Dane. I, remem I remembered so much, uh, so, so many stories, but, but recreated in my mind. And I, my grandfather died and I never sent the letter and I kept on writing. And a year later, I had 560 pages on the kitchen counter. And that was the House of the Spirits, without a plan, without a script, without an editor, with nothing. I mean, and, and at the time there were no computers. So you can imagine how dirty the manuscript was. <laughs> when, yeah, at the time, if you said cut and paste, you cut with scissors and you paste with glue. 
the, <laughs> the lead was a white liquid that, that you would paint the, the page with a white liquid and then write on top. You had to wait until the liquid dried. And, and then what you wrote on top had to be the same length. So, <laughs> so that was how oh, manuscripts looked really terrible at the time. <laughs> you were too young to know that. Oh, that's not true. I remember those, those white out <laughs> bottles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I had to take that class to learn how to use the typewriter in high school. Oh, yeah. Not in high school, in middle school will be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it was electric. <laughs> Isabel, I love that the story um, about your grandfather brings us full circle to the new book that you have coming next spring, um, because he plays a role in the beginning of that book as well, um, your new book called The Soul of a Woman. I, I've said many times that I was a feminist when I was five years old, before feminism was a word in Chile, and of course in my family. Catholic, conservative, patriarchal. The feminism was completely unknown. So when I had this anger and this rebelliousness against all male authority, I was just the lunatic in the family. My mother thought that, that, that I needed, I don't know, that probably I had colleagues or something wrong with me. Um, there were no child therapists that I can remember. So if I had taken me, if they had taken me to some child psychologist, maybe I would have been cured of feminism. But because that was not available, I remained a feminist for forever until now. And so that's what the little book, um, Soul of a Woman, is about. It's about being raised in, in, in that environment, having my grandfather, as I said before, like a voice inside me, so patriarchal, so male, and yet so loving. I adored him. And, and how uh, uh, all that environment, plus the Catholic Church, the weight of the Catholic Church, formed me. Formed me to be exactly the opposite of what I, had. I was being told and taught. I was raised to be a lady and I became this, what you see here. My mother was terribly disappointed. Okay. <laughs> And uh, Isabel, well, now that we're talking about uh, being a woman uh, and going back a little bit to uh, a long pedal of the sea, um, I, per I fell in love with the character uh, Roser uh, and how she grows throughout uh, the book and how she's put through very difficult circumstances and she meets every one of them. Um, is this, uh, is, is, did you create this character or this character came to you with the idea of showing the essence of a woman, a woman, a women's character? No, I don't try to give a message or, or to, to preach anything. I just portray what life is about. I'm surrounded by women like Rosaire. I have a foundation. The mission of the foundation is to invest in the power of women and girls. We get to meet women. I say we because it's my daughter-in-law, Lori, who runs the foundation and me. We get to meet women who have gone through hell. They have lost everything, sometimes including their children. They have gone through the most traumatic kind of violence. And yet they get back on their feet and some of them become leaders in their communities. They are never defeated. They are able to sing and dance after they have gone through all kinds of, of horror. So those are my, the, the people who inspire me. Why would I write about, why would I write about someone who doesn't have a problem in life, who has psychological anxiety? I respect other people's psychological psychological anxiety, but I'm not interested in writing about it because the world is full of extraordinary people who have tragic lives and they survive. Those are my characters. But I don't have to invent them, Johanna. They are there. They are there. Isabel, is there anything that you regret in your life? 
Yes. I regret that I have hurt some people, sometimes without even knowing, because I go through life too quickly, and I can be hurting people or offending people without even noticing, because I'm just running ahead. Uh, and whenever I have betrayed someone, when I have been disloyal, that I regret, of course. Could you tell us uh, what is your what do you consider is your biggest strength? Discipline. What is your biggest weakness? I'm sentimental. <laughs> <laughs> if you if you could go back in time and give advice to yourself when you were twenty, what would you tell Isabel? Calm down. There's time. You don't have to hurry so much you don't have to do so much just enjoy life more don't work so hard if you were going to get a whole nother life to do a whole nother career what would you be well i don't know because uh, i am happy with my life i i never thought i would achieve what i have achieved but i would have loved to have one marriage many children, an extended family, a large home with a large table, many dogs, that would have been a nice life. I will always have my job, whatever job I choose to do. I'm being in love with my job. I love to work. It's but, I, but, but I think that what I, what I miss the most was the dream that I had when I married at 20, that I would live in this extended family with a lot of people and that my children would have, I would live in a compound with, with a wall so that nobody could, could get out. That is the idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> how, how do you want your loved ones to remember you? What do you want them to remember about you? That I was kind. That I was kind and generous, which is which I'm not. But but it would be nice if they remembered me <laughs> that way. True. <laughs> that would be really that. nice. <laughs> I have one for you, Isabel. Who do you? What actress do you want to play you in the movie of your life? Pe Penelope Cruz. <laughs> okay. <laughs> She's gorgeous, you know. <laughs> That's how I would love to look. <laughs> when, when do you think you are the most inspired? Well, I am the most in, inspired in the mornings. And um, when th th the book starts, I am I'm struggling. Struggling with the tone, with the narrative voice, with the story, with the character, with everything. But there's a point. And I would say around week number five, probably, there's a point when something clicks and then a character does something that is unexpected, that I, I have no idea that that could come up. And then I know that I have tapped into something that is not that I'm making it up. It's, it's there and I just have to find it. And, and that's the moment when I feel inspired. And it, it, that feeling accompanies me to the end of the book, usually. Sometimes, if I get stuck, I know that I have taken a wrong turn, that that's not part of the story. And if I get stuck for too long, I just cut it off. I say, okay, this, this has to be eliminated because it's the wrong direction. So inspiration is for me like dancing. It's a rhythm. You get into the groove and you keep dancing. Can, can you talk to us a little bit about your passion for life? My passion for life? Well, I love. Know. There's no alternative, is there? <laughs> <laughs> the alternative is just be dead. <laughs> I, I don't know. My life has been about ups and downs, about um, cro crossroads where something interrupts the, the, the journey and I have to make a decision and take a turn 
and go in another direction that I had not expected and that is scary. Uh, what has helped me in life is one thing that my stepfather said the first time that I was inviting to a, invited to a dance. I must have been 14 years old and I was terrified. I didn't want to go because I thought no one will dance with me. I will be the ugliest girl in the room and the shortest and nobody's going to dance with me. And my, my stepfather said, what's wrong with you? And I said, I'm afraid. And he said, well, remember, everybody's more afraid than you. And I have remembered that all my life. When I confront a situation in which I'm scared, I always think, well, everybody's more scared than me. So go forward. And that has helped me to confront most things in life. Also, I realize that in the really tragic circumstances, in those crossroads, I, am, I don't have any control. It's life that has put me under those circumstances. And I, I'm not in control of the circumstances. I'm only in control of how I react to them. And, and that, is, that also helps me. For example, when my daughter died, there, there was nothing I could do to, to change the situation, to make it even a little bit better. I could only... I could only react to it. And I could have been horribly depressed and suicidal, and I was for a few days, or just get back on my feet and realize that I had grandchildren, that there was life, that, that I could live with her inside me. And that's what I did. So um, passion for life is mostly that I am healthy and I am never depressed never depressed. I've been sad, horribly sad, but never that feeling of paralysis that depression brings. And I know about it because in my family, depression runs, in my family before it was called melancholy or something like that. And that was my grandmother. My, my mother was medicated for depression all, all her adult life. So it, it, but it, it's all over in my family. But I was saved from that and I'm so grateful for it. And um, since we're uh, taping this podcast uh, mainly because of Hispanic Heritage Month, uh, could we talk a little bit about um, democracy and the you have experience in your own life what happens when the democracy ends um, and do you see any similarities to what is happening in the United States today? I think that democracy in the United States is at, is at risk. Uh, in every society, always, there are anti-democratic forces. And uh, given certain circumstances, they emerge. For example, in times of war, of catastrophe, of economic deprivation, uh, then is when democracy is more at risk. Um, and we are living special times right now, dangerous times, and we have a leadership that uh, is divisive and that has, is um, catering to those forces that I'm talking about. So it is easy to de demolish the institutions that have taken centuries to put together. It's very easy. In Chile, we had the strongest and longest democracy in Latin America, and it ended in 24 hours. The military took over, and in 24 hours, it ended for 17 years. And people do not know in this country what it is, what the alternative is. Let me explain what happened in Chile. In 24 hours, there was no more Congress no more independent judiciary, no more freedom of the press, no more freedom to gather more than six people without a permit. There was curfew at night for 17 years. There, there was no habeas corpus. That means that any person could be arrested. And if when there is habeas corpus, in a number of hours or days, that person needs to be released or judged or take to trial. Without that, you can be arrested and you disappear and no one hears from you again. 
or you can be in prison for 20 years without being tried, as it happens now, for example, in many places in Central America. So all those things that we take for granted, the brutality of the police would be rampant, the military would be in the streets, the, the, any opposition is demolished at birth. So there is no dissent. And if you dissent, you risk your life. So all that has to be taken into consideration when we talk about authoritarian governments. And we can see them all over the world. It's yeah. very powerful hearing about that from somebody. Many, many people in America have never lived in anywhere that wasn't in democracy. And to, talk, to hear somebody talk about what it's like in a place when that goes away is really powerful. Also, usually this kind of government, the very, very authoritarian governments and very repressive that control everything are very macho. It's a, the extreme patriarchy. So it's a very difficult time for women. We get to lose what we what has taken many decades to conquer. Yeah, and that's the importance of voting. Voting um, is essential. If you don't vote, you are not participating in democracy, so don't complain afterward. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, Jennifer, do you have uh, more questions to add? I don't have any more questions. I just want to um, end our interview, which I feel so lucky to have been a part of. Um, by asking Isabel if she has any books that she'd like to recommend to the listeners. Well, because I'm writing right now, I have been researching mostly. So the books that I might recommend would be of absolutely no interest to anybody. Mm -hmm. The only uh, thing that, that I'm reading that is not research is uh, Where the Light Enters by Jill Biden, because I am hoping that I will be in conversation with her. And uh, it's a, an extraordinarily um, honest, candid memoir about herself, but of course it's about Joe Biden also. And it's a story, I would say it's a story of family and love mostly. The, a family that has gone through terrible tragedies and mourning and what keeps them alive and thriving is that they are together. So all the big decisions in that family are taken together. So for example, Joe Biden is, uh, will be the candidate. He doesn't take the decision alone with Jill. He calls the children and grandchildren and they are, and they all together decide. And when I was talking about how I would love to have an extended family and that big table, they have it. <laughs> they do. <laughs> that, that is, that is wonderful. I, I, uh, watch a video during the DNC convention where his uh, granddaughters yes, ask talked. him to run. Yes, <laughs> ask him to run. <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for the recommendation, Isabel, and thank you so much for the conversation. We've loved talking to you for this podcast. Thank you. I hope that we would get to see each other more, yes. <laughs> even on Zoom. Hopefully. Soon. Yes, yes. Next time we have to do it later in the day so we can have a little wine. A little wine and just, just talk. We don't have to have a podcast. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs>
At the station, doctors, paramedics, and nurses evaluated the soldiers, immediately dispatching the most serious cases to the hospital and classifying the others according to the part of the body where they had been wounded. Group A, arms. Group B, legs. Group C, head. And so on. They were then transferred to the corresponding center with labels around their necks. The wound had arrived by the hundreds, and each diagnosis and decision had to be made in no more than a few minutes. But the chaos and confusion were misleading, for no one was left unattended, no one was left behind. Those in need of surgery were sent to the old Sant'Andreo building in Manresa. Those requiring treatment were dispatched to other centers. The remainder were left where they were, since nothing could be done to save them. Volunteer women would moisten their lips, whisper to them, and comfort them as if they were their own children, in the knowledge that somewhere else another woman might be cradling their own son or brother. Later, the stretcher bearers would take them to the morgue. The little soldier had a wound in his chest, and the doctor, after a swift examination during which he could detect no pulse, decided the boy was beyond all help and had no need of either morphine or consolation. On the battlefield, they had strapped a bandage around his chest to protect the wound with an inverted tin plate. But nobody knew how many hours or days, how many trains ago that had been. Dalmau was there to assist the doctors. Although it was his duty to leave the boy and attend to the next case, he thought that if the youngster had survived the shock, the hemorrhaging, and the journey to reach this station platform, he must really want to live and so it would be a shame to surrender him to death now. Carefully removing the bandages, he saw to his amazement that the wound was still open and was as clean as if it had been painted onto his chest. He couldn't understand how the bullet had shattered the ribs and part of the sternum, and yet had left the heart intact. Having worked for nearly three years on the side of the Republicans in the Spanish Civil War, at first on the fronts at Madrid and Teruel, and then at the evacuation hospital at Manresa, Victor Dalmau thought he had seen everything, become immunized to the suffering of others, but he had never seen an actual beating heart. Fascinated, he watched the final, increasingly slow and sporadic pulsation until it ceased completely, and the little soldier finally passed away without a sigh. For a brief moment, Dalmau simply stood there, contemplating the red hole where the heartbeats had ceased. This was to be his most stubborn, persistent memory of the war. That 15 or 16-year-old boy, still smooth-cheeked, filthy with the dirt of battle and dried blood, laid out on a stretcher with his heart exposed to the air. Victor was never able to explain to himself why he inserted three fingers of his right hand into the gaping wound, gently grasped the organ, and squeezed it rhythmically several times, quite calmly and naturally, for how long he couldn't remember, perhaps thirty seconds, or perhaps an eternity. Suddenly he felt the heart coming back to life between his fingers, first with an almost imperceptible tremor, soon with a strong, regular beat. If I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, I never would have believed it, said one of the doctors who had approached without Dalmau noticing. He called over two stretcher bearers, ordering them to rush the wounded youth to the hospital. This was a special case. Where did you learn that? He asked Dalmau, as soon as the men had lifted the little soldier onto the stretcher. The boy's face was still ashen, but he had a pulse. Victor Dalmau, a man of few words, told the doctor that he had managed to complete three years of medical studies in Barcelona before leaving for the front as an auxiliary. Thank you for listening to Books Connect Us. For more great book recommendations and information about your favorite authors, feel free to follow Penguin Random House on social media or visit penguinrandomhouse.com. And if you've enjoyed what you've heard, go ahead and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts as it helps more listeners to find our show. This podcast is produced by Pat Stango and edited by Clayton Gumbert. I've been Aaron Leaf, and until next time, this has been Books Connect Us. Thank you.